Tonight's lesson has been stewing for a long time, and that could be bad for you. You, you helped to uh, choose this lesson. Whenever we began our series on why we love the Bible on Sunday mornings at the beginning of the year, I asked you to look at some sub-points on one of our main points in a lesson and choose one of them to become a full-fledged sermon. So tonight's sermon is about a sub-point, and so these are sub-sub-points that I'm going to be giving to you. But like I said, it's It's been stewing for almost two months now. And that means that I've kept on throwing stuff in there that I thought would be good. And it could be that all the the liquid has boiled away and we're left. Hopefully you don't get a big pile of indistinguishable mess tonight. But I, I spent a lot of the afternoon trying to decide what not to talk about finally. But it came about during this lesson that we had on the Bible is God's Word. And the point was, how do we know the Bible is God's Word? And we talked about several different ways. And you all did a great job of responding and saying, well, let's think a little bit more about that. And the topic that you, uh, more than any other, said, let's think about that, was the Bible's precision. Well, that's what we're going to do for a little while tonight, to think about the Bible's precision. Ironically, that word actually leaves me some pretty expansive space to talk about a few things uh, when it comes to the Bible. I want to think, first of all, about the Bible's precision from book to book. And the first thing, whenever you think about that, is what we have called for many years the unity of the Bible. Over a span of about 16 centuries, God used about 40 men all kinds of men uh, to produce this book. But they stuck with one theme. They agreed in all the details, and they gave us one story. And all of that indeed indicates that they didn't write on their own. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. These 66 books from Genesis to Revelation are not randomly related books. They all play a part in carrying the story forward from the beginning of it in Genesis to the end of it in Revelation. And if you just think about Genesis itself, it tells us how God created the world and how He created people, men and women, in perfection. Adam and Eve lived in a garden paradise. They had it good. And they were close to God. They walked and talked with Him. They had access to the tree of life. As long as they could keep eating the tree of life, they would never die. But as we read Genesis, it doesn't look like that lasted very long. We don't know how long it did. But it didn't last very long because Eve was tempted and so was Adam. And they ate of the one tree in the garden that God said, Don't eat from that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They ate from it. And they lost their intimate relationship with God because of sin. Well, real quick, in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible starts telling the story of how God is going to save people from sin. And so that advances through the Old Testament. And we learn that it's going to require God's grace. And He's going to require of people faith and obedience. And finally, in the New Testament, we find fellowship with God restored through Christ, and in His church. The Bible's last book, Revelation, pictures people in eternally happy relationship with God, in His presence. And there in Revelation chapter 22, you find the tree of life all over again, on either side of the river of life. Turn with me to Luke chapter 24. And let's listen to Jesus say, all this that I've just been talking about revolves around Him. The Bible is about the salvation of man by God through Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 24, after Jesus is risen from the dead, He encounters, or some disciples of His, two of them encounter Him as they're walking on the road to Emmaus, and they don't recognize Him for quite a while. They were disbelieving of what they had heard from the women who had witnessed Jesus is alive. 
verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Scriptures are about Jesus. Later in the chapter, Jesus is with his apostles. And he does the same thing all over again. Beginning in verse 44 of Luke 24, he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Well, that's where all the Scripture had been pointing to that point. And now we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about Jesus, and He has come. The rest of the Bible assure us He's coming again. There's one story in the Bible. The writers are united on it. Even when you come to sections of Scripture uh, like these Gospels, that have the same specific subject matter. They complement each other in many ways. They do not contradict each other. And that's incredible. Forty men of all kinds over a period of 1,600 years tell one story without contradiction. That's incredible. That doesn't mean everybody believes they do it that way, though. So I'd like to show you just one test case before we proceed tonight. Look with me at John chapter 19, verses 19 and 20. John chapter 19, verses 19 and 20. It's an account of the crucifixion. And the Bible says, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews... Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. As I was uh, trying to read a little more and study a little bit more, learn more about the inspiration of the Bible a couple of months ago, I came across something that a now deceased brother in Christ wrote, and I was very, very sad to read it. He observed that each of the gospel writers said something about the sign atop the cross, and he wrote, three of them have to be wrong. And, and that brother made many disciples of himself over the years. Here are the facts. We could open to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, given time, and and we'll read about this sign that Pilate put atop the cross of Christ. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 37, we're told it said, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. In Mark chapter 15, verse 26, the King of the Jews. In Luke 23, 38, this is the King of the Jews. And in John chapter 19, verse 19, as we just read, Jesus of Nazareth the king of the Jews. Now, I ask you, do we have a contradiction? If these four gospel writers said, this is what the sign said that Pilate put up, do we have a contradiction? Let me suggest a few things. Number one, the accusation is the same in every one of them. Why was Jesus being crucified? He claimed to be the king of the Jews. And those who led the Jews didn't believe it. And so they drove him to crucifixion. Maybe out of all of them, John records the full inscription that was up there. Now when you think about those then that are shorter, those two in the middle in particular, Mark and Luke, do you think there was a need for those writers to tell everybody, this is Jesus whom we're talking about. No need at all. Was Jesus being crucified because he was from Nazareth? Not at all. 
because he claimed to be the king of the Jews, there was no controversy about his hometown. What was a little detail that John added for us in verse 20? At the end of the verse, he said it was written in Aramaic and in Latin and in Greek. So what was up there on the sign was written in three languages. Now, what can we do with that? We can think about that sign painter for just a moment. Probably wasn't Pilate himself, but he had someone do that, someone who always did that for all the crosses, I'm sure. And what might we, what might we guess about the sign painter? Well, we might guess he was more or less proficient in any one of these languages. Now, maybe he wrote things that looked like all of this, depending on which language you're talking about. And which one God was having these gospel writers then to put in Greek, as the New Testament was originally written. As you think about this sign painter, as he's going about this work, he might have been more or less enthused to write the whole thing out again in another language. Any number of things we could think of along those lines. But what we get here in, in these passages is something that's complementary. Nothing contradictory at all. We know what the accusation was. We know who was hanging on that cross. We know where he was from. And when we come to anything that someone would suggest is a contradiction in the Bible, there's an answer. There might be a, a number of ways to answer the allegations that are made, but those are just a few that get us to thinking tonight. And nothing like this should, should cause us to think, well, what we've been told is not right. The Bible's not consistent book to book. Indeed it is, and we have every reason to believe so. Well, as we keep thinking about the Bible's precision, we can move on to another area, and that is science. As people have often said, the Bible is not a science textbook. True. Its objectives are much more important than that. The Bible can speak about things from time to time through the pages just the way we do in unscientific ways. For example, you and I talk about sun up and sun down, and someone might talk about the four corners of the earth. Does that mean we're being unscientific? Well, we're not trying to be scientific at that point. And we understand that the sun's not really going up, the sun's not really going down. We know that's, that's not how the whole system works, but it's what we see. It's how we perceive it. The Bible does say the, the four corners or the four winds or something like that in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 12. So the Bible uses words the way we do sometimes. But from time to time, something pops through. And if you're honest, you have to ask, where did that come from? For example, let's think about stars for a few moments. Look back with me at Genesis chapter 15 and verse 5. And, and remember a pivotal promise that God made to Abram, whom he would later name Abraham. Abram and Sarah have no children, and they are old people. And they're not expecting to be able to have children anymore. But it's going to happen, God assures them. And in verse 5, the Bible says, And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Now plant this in your mind for a few moments. Taking the Bible for what it's worth, that's some 1,500 years B.C. And then turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 23. Nehemiah chapter 9, and verse 23. Now we're going to be reading something, taking the Bible for what it's worth, that, that's happening about 400 years before the time of Christ. Offering up praise to God, 
Nehemiah says, You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven, and you brought them into the land that you had told their fathers to enter and possess. So he's thinking back to those promises made to to Abram and to Isaac and to Jacob, and he says, Their descendants are numerous like the stars now. 1500 B.C., that's the way it'll be. More than 400 years B.C., Nehemiah said that's the way it is. Now, what kind of number are we talking about? As numerous as the stars. I want you to think about this. A a thousand years or so had passed from the time Moses wrote until Nehemiah did. You got more than that between the time from Abraham to Nehemiah. How impressive would it be that over a space of 1,800, or excuse me, 1,300, 1,400 years or so, that somebody had uh, had a, a, a thousand descendants? Is that impressive over a, over a period of 1,300 or 1,400 years? I don't think so. Everybody with grandchildren, raise your hand. Put your hand down unless you have two or more grandchildren. If you've got two or more, keep it up. Who has five or more grandchildren? Raise them high. All right. Eight or more grandchildren. Ten or more grandchildren. Do I see any? <laughs> Twelve or more grandchildren. We're going to stop right there. All right. Murrays and Deffenbaugh's are as prolific as cats, aren't they? (laughs) Do you have any problem imagining that that there'd be a thousand of them a thousand years from now? Not at all. Just imagine how many dozens there are right now. You all probably don't even know the number, do you? Whenever... God told Moses or told Abraham what he told him, and it was recorded by Moses. Whenever Nehemiah says it's that way, that meant there were a whole bunch, more than Abraham could have ever imagined at the time that was written. Now, while you've got all that in your mind, think about these numbers that have been offered up down through time. In 150 B.C., Hipparchus indicated his belief that there are a total of 1,026 stars. In 150 A.D., thereabouts, Ptolemy suggested there are 1,056 stars. And then Johann Kepler, one of history's most influential scientists, advocated just 400 years ago that there are 1,005 stars. Now, what do you know? You don't know how many stars there are, but, but you know those were terrible guesses, weren't they? As educated as they thought their guesses were, and I'm not sure they thought they were guessing. I think they thought they had counted them up. But the more powerful the telescope developed, the better the view gained, and the more stars we see behind the stars... Abraham and Moses did not have telescopes. Nehemiah did not have a telescope. Where did they get information like they had? When other people are thinking they're about a thousand stars, where did they get that? Psalm 147, verse 4, the psalmist praised God saying, He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. In Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25 and 26, here's what Isaiah had to say with words from God. I stirred up, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25 and 26. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power. Not one is missing. Now, God never told Abraham or Moses the number. 
And he never told Nehemiah the number, but it was a number like nobody in their days understood. It was a number like nobody 400 years ago understood. How did they know it was a number like that when everybody else was saying something different? These men were inspired by God. There's no other explanation. While we're thinking about uh, matters of science, let's think about health in the human body. I'm going to read something that someone else wrote. In spite of the fact that Moses was reared in an Egyptian environment, was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, as Acts 7.22 says, not one time did the great lawgiver incorporate any of this magical mumbo-jumbo into the scriptures that's found in the writings of the Egyptians. On the contrary, Moses was far ahead of his time in terms of medicine and sanitation. Some of you before have studied Leviticus 13 for these reasons. And with reference there to certain skin diseases, he reveals some rather modern techniques like disinfection and quarantine. No other law code in the whole of ancient history came anywhere near rivaling these health regulations. Consider, for instance, the fact that the leper was required to cover his upper lip. Now, we all tell our kids to do this right now when you cough, so we don't spread things. Back then, a leper was told to cover his upper lip, keep it covered. Dr. J.S. Morton has noted, since the leprosy bacilli are transmitted from nasal drippings and saliva, this practice of having lepers cover their lips was a good hygienic policy. And there it sat in the law of Moses 3,500 years ago. Now listen to this one. There's a document called the Papyrus Ebers. It's named after the man who edited it, discovered it and edited it in 1874. This thing from about the time of Moses offered some strange remedies for various illnesses. See what you think about this, Charlie. Chandler here. I'm thinking hard about it. Pat, here was a prescription for folks who were losing their hair. Written about the time of Moses. When it falls out, apply a mixture of six fats, namely those of the horse, the hippopotamus, the crocodile, the cat, the snake, and the ibex. To strengthen it, anoint it with the tooth of a donkey crushed in honey. Now, then when you open your Bible and read from the book of Leviticus, things that make medical sense today, and consider that that's what was going on everywhere else around the world, it's not just what's in the Bible, it's what's not in the Bible as well. The Bible's not a science textbook, but the Bible's never wrong about matters of science. One more while we're thinking about this. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Paul's speaking in Athens toward the people, or with the people who, who think they are the smartest of the day. Acts 17, 26, he's telling them about God, and he says, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. That's far enough. He made from one. Some of your Bibles say blood. It might be in italics. I hope it is because that word's not in the the Greek text, but that was translators thinking, what should we put here? But there's a masculine word there, for he made from one, as if from one man, from one male. Every nation of mankind live on all the face of the earth. When Paul said that, he was standing in front of a crowd of people who boasted that Athenians were an indigenous people, that they were specially created, and everybody else was a barbarian. And there's Paul standing before them saying, God made from one man every race, that there's just one race when you come down to it, 
the human race. But you think about how uh, ideas like these that the Athenians held have prevailed across the centuries. Herbert Spencer developed the theory of social Darwinism, and he argued that Caucasians, white people, are superior to all other races. How familiar does that sound? Well, we know what Hitler did with that when he developed his idea of the master race. As late as World War II, the U.S. Red Cross segregated blood for transfusion purposes according to race. My dear old grandpa went to his grave wondering because of that, are a black man's blood and a white man's blood the same? But then that true story that I told you this morning about Dr. Weinstein, a Jew who would go to El Salvador to perform heart surgery and save a little boy's life there who's Hispanic, but not without donating his blood to him. So how have all these prevailed over all this time But Paul, 2,000 years ago, could say, God made from one man all the people. We we really are the same. God inspired him. So science textbooks have to be revised continually. We think it's a shame if our kids are in school and they got old science books. But the Bible will always be right. The Bible's precise. A third area here, let's think about history for a moment. This really, really matters. It makes the Bible different from the foundation books of every other religion in the world. You have some books like the Quran that don't bother to, to go at things historically, really. And then you have books like the Book of Mormon, which fail the test historically, because of anachronisms and other, other things in them. Point out two things about the Bible historically. In times past, people have said that uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy cannot be what they claim to be. They cannot be what the rest of the Bible claims that they are, the writings of Moses some 15 centuries B.C., There was no alphabet to write with at that time, so they said. The first mention of writing in the Bible is in Exodus chapter 17, verse 14. In the 19th century, just two centuries ago, the people who thought they were really smart were saying these things about the Bible. There, There was no alphabet for them to write with at that time. Well, no one would dream of making that statement today. An alphabet that's a direct precursor to the Hebrew in which Moses wrote was discovered in the Sinai Peninsula that dates back centuries before Moses. But people run their mouths about the Bible and how it can't be believed, and, and then every once in a while something just comes along that shuts them up entirely. And that's an example. We've talked about this one before, but it always bears repeating. Thinking about the New Testament. In the late 1800s, there was a Bible skeptic named Sir William Ramsey. And in particular, he doubted the authenticity of the book of Acts. He set out on an archaeological expedition to find things so that other people would be convinced to think about things the way that He did. He was going to disprove the historicity and the accuracy of what Luke wrote. But after years of research and and exploration, he was forced to conclude that Acts was historically accurate. He himself pointed out that Luke refers to 32 countries in the book of Acts, to 54 cities and to 9 Mediterranean islands. He refers to 95 persons, 62 of them who are not named elsewhere in the New Testament. And every single illusion, where checkable, has been shown to be absolutely accurate. As just one example, we could think about Acts chapter 13, verse 7. 
the Bible there says that a man named Sergius Paulus was a proconsul in Cyprus. Well, scholars thought, well, that can't be true. It has to be wrong because Cyprus was an imperial province. That's the way Rome treated it. And in imperial provinces, the proper title for a ruler would be not proconsul, but propraetor. But then it was discovered that by Paul's day, Cyprus had become a senatorial province. And you know what they call these guys in a senatorial province? They call them proconsuls. All it took was a little digging around to look at history and see that Luke was telling it right before we heard it from anybody else in modern times. Ramsey started out believing that that Acts had been written in the second half of the second century to paint a rosy picture of the church for the church. He didn't believe it was written in the middle of the first century. Shortly after some of those events had happened, really right in the middle of all of them. He did not want to believe, but after his thorough investigation, he could not help but believe. The Bible gets it right, historically. And let's come to one last category here that that really undergirds a lot of the things that we're talking about tonight. That's archaeology. Many years ago, Wayne Jackson wrote a good little book titled The Biblical titled Biblical Studies in Light of Archaeology. And as he was getting going, he said that archaeology has, number one, aided in the identification of biblical places and in the establishment of biblical dates. And number two, assisted in our understanding of ancient customs and obscure language idioms. Number three, archaeology has shed new light on numerous biblical words. Number four, it has enhanced our understanding of certain points of New Testament doctrine. Number five, it's progressively silenced the infidel critics of the inspired word of God, like it did Ramsey. Now, on this last point we're talking about, I want to do some reading from other people, because I do not claim any expertise in archaeology. Here's in a a lectureship that... Wendell Winkler conducted in 1979. Bill Umble uh, gave a lecture and wrote a chapter for this book on external evidences for the Bible's inspiration, archaeology. He wrote about what was found in the Hittite city of Hattusas. I want to read this section. The long-lost Hittite city of Hattusas was discovered in Turkey. The findings at Hattusis are especially interesting to students of the Bible, for the rediscovery of the Hittites provided specific confirmation of the Bible at a point where its accuracy had long been questioned. According to the Old Testament, the Hittites were a prominent people and are mentioned 40 times in passages from Genesis to Nehemiah. When the Lord promised Abraham that his seed would inherit Canaan, he listed the Hittites among the nationalities in the land, Genesis 15.20. When Sarah died and Abraham sought a burial place for her, he bargained with Ephron the Hittite for the cave of Machpelah, Genesis 23, 1-16. And centuries later, David fell into sin with Bathsheba, who is identified as the wife of Uriah the Hittite, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 3. Despite these numerous Old Testament references, there were some 19th century scholars who were skeptical of the Bible's accuracy. There was no reference to the Hittites in non-biblical sources. The Greek and Roman historians did not even mention them. It was easy for popular critics of the Bible, like Robert Ingersoll, to ridicule the Bible and brush aside the Hittites as just another legend. But not today. Late in the 19th century, a British scholar, A. H. Sacy, published a book titled The Hittites, the story of a forgotten empire. Sacy had found references in Egyptian hieroglyphic inscriptions to a people called the Hattai. He theorized that these Hattai were the same as the biblical Hittites. Sacy's theory proved to be correct when in 1906, Henry Winkler, not that Henry Winkler, 
a German archaeologist, discovered Hattusis, the capital of the Hittite Empire in central Turkey. Later excavations unearthed a vast library of clay tablets, some going back to around 1700 B.C. Now, when's that? That's getting back between Moses and Abraham. Sections of the city walls and gates of Hattusis have been unearthed. The gates were constructed with large stones tilted toward the top to form a vault. The gates were decorated with sculptures which included Hittite warriors. Since the discoveries at Hattusis, articles relating to the Hittites have been found in other lands. Egyptian sculpture has been found that pictures the Hittite soldiers who were taken prisoners in a great battle between the Egyptians and Hittites at Kadesh on the Orontes River in 1286 B.C. The Hattusis Library included a treaty of peace negotiated about 1270 B.C. between Pharaoh Ramses II and the Hittite king Hattusul. This is the oldest peace treaty between nations ever discovered. And an interesting piece of Hittite sculpture picturing a dog attacking a lion is now on display in the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem. What makes this piece of art special of special interest is where it was found, at Beth Shan in Palestine. This discovery proves that the Hittites were in Palestine in the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, just as the Bible says. I'm confident that that kind of stuff is just going to keep on happening for the rest of time, as long as archaeologists keep digging. Another item, an inscription from about 830 B.C. was discovered at Dan. That's a city close to the source of the Jordan River not too many years ago. It refers to the king of Israel and the house of David. It makes it the earliest reference to David outside the Bible. Just like all this other stuff, there were scholars for a long time who said there was no David. No King David like you read about in the Bible. But here you have an inscription about the house of David, about the kings of Israel from 830 B.C., just a little over a hundred years after David's time. Read with me from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26 is called by some people the priestly blessing. You might have sung it before. It says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Numerous tombs over the last few years have come to light around Jerusalem, including one which yielded an inscription on two silver amulets of these very words. And these amulets date to about the 6th century B.C., now, what's the big deal about that? Well, critics have said that the book of Numbers wasn't put together till a couple hundred years before the time of Christ. This, this is the earliest copy of any portion of Scripture that's ever been found. It was found in the late 1970s. I don't know if any of the guys last week on the trip to Oklahoma City went to classes that Dale Manor was teaching. He's a faithful brother who teaches in the Bible department at Harding University, and he is an archaeologist. He's the archaeologist who coordinates the excavation of a particular site in Israel these days. He wrote a few things that I want to share with you. He said the discovery of a way station for overnight stops in the northeast Sinai desert has yielded several inscriptions which refer to Baal, Yahweh, and Asherah. The site occupied during the late 9th century B.C. was frequented by travelers from Judah, Israel, Phoenicia, and Edom. One inscription reads, May you be blessed by Yahweh of Samaria and his Asherah. Scholarly debate swirls around to whom or what the term Asherah refers, but the inscription unquestionably demonstrates a syncretistic mindset that was an object of the prophetic tirades. What is syncretism? Syncretism is the belief that you can worship all kinds of gods. Just synthesize it and do all of that. 
Well, the prophets of Israel and Judah were continually prophesying against the people of Israel for doing that. We think about Jews today, and we think about their long history, and it's hard to imagine religious Jews today worshiping more than one god. They're monotheists. But here's archaeological evidence that they were doing just that, just like the Bible says. Jack Lewis wrote about Ostraca. Those are fragments of pottery that have writing on them. Ostraca from Samaria that reveal about as many names that have Baal, compound words, compound names, as names that have Yahweh, compound names. And the absence of Baal, compounds, and finds from Judah suggest that the lesser penetration of the worship of Baal in the southern kingdom. You remember, if we know our Bible history, the northern kingdom, which had Samaria as its capital, fell first. Why? Because of their idolatry. They were worshiping Baal along with God. It wasn't happening so much. In the south at that time, in Judah, archaeology seems to bear that out. One from the New Testament. We're getting close to being done. Luke recorded that Paul met Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. You remember that in Acts chapter 18, verse 2? Suetonius, a Roman historian, wrote about what Claudius did. He said that he commanded all the Jews to leave Rome because they constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Crestus. Most people think take that to be a reference to Christ. Another Roman historian named Erosius spoke about the same occurrence, and he dated it in the ninth year of Claudius, which would have been in January A.D. 49 to January A.D. 50. Luke also recorded that Paul was brought before the judgment seat of Gallio, who was proconsul of Achaia. An inscription that was found at a place called Delphi shows that Claudius installed Gallio as proconsul in A.D. 51 and 52. The emperor referred to him as Gallio, my friend and proconsul. Some of you who have taught Acts know that that's the thing deep into the book of Acts which allows you to get a handle on when was everything happening then. It helps us to understand Acts more historically. Here's A.D. 51 or 52. That's real helpful. People often argue, Dale Manor writes, that times have changed, therefore the Bible's no longer relevant. Archaeology can show that times have not changed. We have changed the technical ways in which we do things, but the heart of humanity remains basically the same. We still have concerns of right and wrong, of families, death, life, food, and the meaning of life. The Bible addresses issues of the heart and seeks to change the heart. Archaeology has helped show the timelessness of human nature and the Bible. One last quotation. This is from Jack Lewis. The contribution of archaeology in these illustrative areas is greater than its contribution of direct contacts with specific biblical events and characters. Most biblical characters and events will always be known to us only from the Bible. Few Hebrew texts from the biblical period have survived outside the Old Testament. The characters of the Bible are significant primarily in the area of religion not in social, political, and economic areas that are more likely to have attracted the attention of record makers among Israel's neighbors. Now, here's what it all comes down to. He said, one can show from archaeology that certain Old Testament events took place, but the interpretation given those events by the biblical writers is not subject to archaeological investigation or verification. In other words, one can show from archaeological finds that the Assyrians exiled the northern kingdom in 722 B.C. and that Sennacherib invaded Judah in 701 B.C. But that the Lord was using the Assyrians for his own purpose must be taken from the Bible alone. Archaeology can neither prove nor disprove that. Well, that's how that all fits together. But Here's what I, I hope that you've gotten from what we've been doing tonight. The Bible deals in real people, real places, real events, and it gets it all right. 
by dealing in the kinds of things that, that we've been talking about tonight, the Bible shows itself to be historical. And by its precision, with tangible people and tangible things, it gives us every re- reason to believe in an intangible God and the intangible things of which He assures us in His Word. We love the Bible. We love the Bible because it is the Word of God. One thing after another just confirms for us. That's sure what it is. And so we love it. We love the God who gave it to us. And we want to do what He tells us to do in that Bible. Are you that kind of person tonight? Are you ready to do what the Bible tells you to do? The Bible tells you that you need to be saved. You need to become a Christian. You need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Study the Bible well, and and you'll have every reason to do that. The Bible says that you need to repent of your sins. You need to confess your faith in Christ. and You need to be baptized in His name for the forgiveness of your sins. You can do that. And if you do that, you can count on God to do what He says He will do for you in the Bible. The Bible also says that you need to be faithful. You need to live that way. And the Bible assures us that when we're having trouble with that, we can pray to God for forgiveness and we can pray to Him for help. And so at the end of every lesson, we want to offer the Lord's invitation. If you can answer it tonight, if you need to, won't you come while we stand and sing together?